There's not much more. Um, water vapor and nitrogen. So it is like, hey, there you go. Cleaner in some cases, depending on what city that it's running in. It's cleaner exhaust than it is the intake sometimes. Um, then we have to direct the exhaust and exhaust gas recirculation flow. So sometimes we do peel away some of the exhaust, put it back into the engine so we can play with the combustion recipe that way. And then we need to branch some recirculated portion of the exhaust flow. So that's kind of the functions of, here's what this thing is supposed to do. We will then decompose that and say, hey, these are the functions. What are the requirements? How do I measure those functions to make sure that I've satisfied those things? And so I have a different perspective on the same need statement, but now I have very specific or more specific saying, hey, the loss coefficient, coefficients for exhaust flow from the exhaust manifold to the turbo shall be less than to be determined unilicit units. Um, or the maximum pressure drop between the cylinder head mounting face and EGR system from the, and so on and so forth, and so many megapascals. So we get down into the requirement statements that are measurable. I can put a gauge to it. I can see what's going on there. Um, then I get into the more CAD perspective. And so what's my system look like? This is, the, I believe, the QSK60 um, engine. So it's a 60 liter engine there. You can count the cylinders. It's one, two, three, four, eight. It says V16. And it looks like it's got four turbochargers on it. And the exhaust goes up to those really big, huge, actually, those are intake. Um, no, that's exhaust. So I think. Get a right look at the pattern. Do, 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 do. Anyhow, so that's another perspective. But then I can say, hey, a piece of that is this exhaust manifold. It's a portion of that exhaust manifold. So there's the CAD model, parametric CAD model of that, of that the same functions. So that widget should do the same functions uh, and be measured by those requirements. Then I can do an FEA mesh and say, here's the mesh. That's a different perspective. And so these are for finite element analysis. You'll get into that. Say, hey, how can I chop this into bits and pieces? So if you've done any of the free body diagram stuff in physics yet, right? So take that and multiply it by, you know, 20,000 nodes. Put all those things together, um, ish, somewhere around there. Uh, but then you can say, hey, what's the thermals look like that? If I, if I start putting heat through this thing, what does it look like? Under which, you know, is it at idle or is it at rated? Um, which a high RPM, right? My maximum power. Then I can look at stresses on the x-axis and the y-axis and see how those figure out. And so these are all different perspectives answering different problems or different questions of the same thing. And then I can do some testing and actually put it in a dyno and run it and figure out, okay, well, what does it actually work? Then I can tear it down and look for soot traces and see, okay, does the actual gases escape these joints? There's a V-band clamp and a Marmon flange joint and uh, making sure that, hey, nothing leaks. Did our bolted joints that we designed and the way we torqued them all up with the gaskets and did that all work. Uh, and so that's a physical teardown, but it's again, it's a perspective on the same system. Um, if I'm doing uh, my quality checks with my manufacturing in the, in, the, in the quality systems, this is the production part approval process. We actually run Minitab to say, hey, here's the st statistics. Do these measurements actually work out right? Well, that's data on that same system, different perspective. Then I can do, um, uh, a Zyglo. I don't know if any of you have seen this. So we actually paint this stuff in a fluorescent paint, um, dip it or whatever we do, we we'll spray it on, and then put a black light, on, black light on it and look for cracks. And so you do crack detection. So you can say, hey, wait a minute. If I've got, you know, when I was doing those, this analysis, it showed that there was a red high stress strain, you know, whatever, a, a poor mismatch, an opportunity for a crack in this particular area. When I actually did the testing, over several hundred hours and did the measurements and all that. And then I actually inspect the part later. Do I actually have a crack or not? And, and can I find those things? And so again, another perspective on the same system. Um, and then I can cut it apart and look for, and do my metrology testing and look for other bits and pieces of stuff that's going around. So again, just another perspective, but same, same system, but I'm asking different questions throughout this whole process. And so the, the tagline for this one is, when the eye sees clearly, the mind can make a clear decision. So I wouldn't be able to say, is there a crack there or not if I just looked at the requirements? I know I don't want one, but am I actually getting that? And so when we start thinking about all of this connected information and all of the digital thread and how we try to go from point A to point B or the start of the V 
all the way to the end or the start of your product development cycle all the way to the end, you are going to be looking at the same problem and the same solution throughout that entire process. But you're going to have different perspectives. Your team members are going to have different points of view. And you're going to find out that, oh, there might be something there that I can actually get into and, and understand from a different perspective. The interesting thing is, to me at least, within Commons is it's like the, the blind man and the elephant uh, poem. Um, it is, you're all looking at a different portion of the thing, the problem set or whatever it might be. And it's like, how do I actually talk as a systems engineer to all of these different people and the team that are going after this particular problem, whatever your community project is for, or whatever it might be. They all have their own personal experiences, their own diversity. They are coming at it from a different perspective. From what I just showed you, there's finite element, you know, applied mechanics engineers that are doing the ANSYS models and whatnot. There are test engineers that are doing the physical testing. There's the design engineer, the development engineer, systems engineer, the risk management person that's actually trying to figure out how can this go wrong. All sorts of different people with all sorts of different background, different perspectives that absolutely are there to help solve the problem. So this is one of the reasons that I'm really happy with Cummins because we have such a, a wide, diverse set of folks. The challenge is, is do, you, do you have the ability to communicate with each of them? To make, as a team leader, it is one of those, how do you apply that in your teams? You don't just sit in an echo chamber of all of the same people and get a same answer. You want to be kind of spreading out and understanding. It's like, hey, if I go look at CNN and I go look at Fox News and I go look at somebody else, I'm going to get different perspectives. I may not agree with all of them, but I need to understand what's their point of view. So you can create your own mental model to help with that. Unfortunately, we don't have the point of view gun from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So you can't just shoot everybody and say, hey, here's my perspective. Boink, right? So another one. Ah, holism. So um, in the same sort of deal, where are you in the system? So understanding your place of your, your tools or your product or your solution, where are you working? What problem are you addressing? Where are you, where are you at? And so um, one of them here is that this is, this is from the CBOC wiki. It's one of my favorite references. It's free. It's, you don't have to sign in or anything. It's just a managed wiki uh, for systems engineering body of knowledge is what it stands for. Um, but this is just a link to the types of systems that are out there. And so you'll see there that you have, you know, the product system of interest, which has got interfaces, the technology, you know, is it, is it a gas turbine? Is it a diesel engine, reciprocating engine? Is it a battery set? Whatever it might be. What technology is it using? How does it interface? You know, my product, you know, Cummins is a product development organization. Um, we also do some of the service system delivery um, and enabling that. So we are, we are, multifaceted in terms of our company. But we are at the top right there governed by, you know, regulations. So EPA, CARB, um, NSX in India and China has got their own emissions regulations, all of these sorts of things. Um, natural systems in terms of just the world outside and so on and so forth. But, you know, hey, here's that engine, right? So that's you know, where am I in the universe, at what level of the system am I at, then really helps me understand that, well, there might be, if I'm a design engineer and I'm thinking, hey, this is my system and I only look at my system, and I don't pay attention to the other stuff around me, in, you know, below my system level, you know, into bits and pieces to the bolts and how is that bolt made or how is that casting made in terms of the manufacturing of it. Um, and then looking above my system, if you will, and looking at, hey, how is this engine actually going to be installed? You know, here I have this same gen set, but it's, it's now attached on a skid to a generator and some uh, air intake and a few other things, and it's actually being put onto the top of a ship or into a ship that's being built. Um, and then you get the city in the background. So we, I had some other pictures I could have picked. We actually have some of these gen sets in skyscrapers, and they're up on like the you know, 50th floor. I mean, they're just, they actually either fly them up their helicopters or they crane them up. And, and they install these generator sets on, you know, it's the reason why elevators skip floors sometimes because there's a huge room that has all of the... What's that? No, this, 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 this diagram is from the wiki, but the pictures are mine. These are Cummins pictures. 
Please do. Upper right hand corner. Yes. Those are artifacts. Everything else is a person or an organization. Ah. I've had students screw up a contract diagram. Because they. Mixing item types in the same diagram? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for calling that out, Bob. I did not catch that. You get the dollar for today. And so what that means to an engineer is yep. they put all this paperwork on the wall and you look at bubble set. Yep. But through a lobbyist, no, there's someone I can go see to change that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So, so this <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it gets into now. You now you now you're starting to peel into Nancy Levison's, uh, you know, safety critical safety safety stamp methodology and all that sort of yes. stuff that gets yeah. into that nested control loops. That the control loop is really kind of fuzzy when you get up at that regulatory level yeah. or national policy level, but it is an influence on the system design. So, so the, the tagline for this one is consider everything, but be selective as uh, I want you to act upon. It, the danger here is that you, you get stuck in un, trying to understand the entire ecosystem of every single thing. Um, and that's the, the, the be selective about what you act upon. It's really, it's because otherwise you, you, you could get into this analysis paralysis. You get stuck and say, well, I don't, I don't know where I am, uh, and so I just need to consider everything. And so it's called scope creep. Say, oh, well, wait a minute, I need to consider this, 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 and this, and this. It's like, no, wait a minute. Find out where you are. Are you in the middle of this for want of a nail poem and say, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the horse and rider system, and that's my system of interest. That's my focus. But you need to know kind of above and below you so my horse has a shoe that has a nail that keeps the shoe on the horse's hoof. Or, you know, so you need to kind of be... Uh, my, my way I operationalize this is I need to know the system I'm working on intimately. I need to know the stuff that's around me or around my system, my key inter my, my interfaces, my interactions immediately around me quite well. And then two levels beyond that, either down in or out, you know, up or down, depending how you think about it, it really doesn't matter. You kind of need to be notionally aware of those, but not much more. Because otherwise you get stuck in there's so many different things and everything connects to everything and you've got the whole butterfly effect that causes the tornado or whatever, that whole spiel, right? So yes, that may actually happen, that may actually be true, but it's not useful for the decision you're making at the time. So the other one is, what, what is it from, uh, so another movie reference. Sorry, you guys get me on movie references for some reason. Um, this was... Um, Oh shoot, Will Smith and Men in Black. Thank you. The Men in Black at the end of the Men in Black movie, number one. They do a zoom out and it goes from really small all the way out to the major universe and it ends up being aliens playing with marbles. So it's, it's one of those massive pullbacks on the camera play tricks. That's real. And, I mean, the concept is, is real, right? So. Maybe not, I don't know, who knows. But anyhow, so another, another principle, tension. Again, back to teams. Do we ever have tension? Do we ever have disagreements? Of course we do, right? Always, there's always something. Hey, you didn't get your work done. Hey, you're not doing your, your share. Or wait a minute, that's not where I would do. What are you doing? Um, tension is, is I, I, I find it helpful. Let me bring in the, the um, tagline here. Tensions are not necessarily problems that can break your system. If you don't address them or acknowledge them, yes, absolutely, they will be a poison that's going to kill whatever thing you're doing. But they are definitely sources of strength that can move you forward if you encourage it in the right direction. Um, if you are in martial arts, uh, I think it's Aikido, um, will let you, it's actually redirection of your opponent's energy. And so same sort of principles is how do you use that energy in that tension, there's something going on that either there's a, you know, they think a certain, you should go this direction versus that direction. Again, it's kind of back to that earlier principle of perspectives. What's going on? What do they see that you don't appreciate? What's their experiences that maybe you don't have? 
there might be something, there's probably something useful there. And so this is listening, not hearing. It is, is, do I understand what's going on? Can I use active listening principles to inquire and find out? Uh, and whether that's through Socratic questions of like who, what, when, where, why, how, the pattern of questions that can get you after what's really going on under the surface. Um, some people put it as like an iceberg. You hear about the stuff on the top floating above the surface, but there's all of the stuff underneath um, that you want to unpack and get into. So from a how do I translate that into product development space within Cummins or within other areas is, is really the descriptive version of tension is there's lots of factors that are going to influence where your solution goes. So in your capstone projects that you're doing with your communities and stuff like that, there's going to be all sorts of inputs in terms of customer needs of your, of your, of your, of your, your, your customers in the, in the community. There's other competitive environments. There's other things going on. Hey, we've always done it this way. Why are you telling me this? Um, there's an overall strategy. Maybe there's a bigger picture view that's going on that's going to influence what the business case is and, and what's going on there. The um, systems architecture here with different technologies. Hey, I've got these. I can, I can do rapid programming and do apps nowadays, and I can get big data, and I can get other stuff that I can mash together that we never had before. And so... Some of the stuff that we deal with at work is the, the we've always done it that way sort of answer. And, and you have to unpack and understand, it's like, well, wait, why have you always done it that way? What are you really trying to accomplish? Because it might be that, well, yeah, we've always done it with a paper document and had Joe sign it because that was the, what we had to do. Well, nowadays you've got digital signatures. I've got, you know, always on active connections. I don't need to run a paper around to get people to sign it. Um, your sign-in sheet is paper, but it's probably you've got the ability to sign in electronically in your classes, right? Do you really need the paper anymore? Does that provide value, or is that just the way we've always done things, right? So it's, it's understanding what's going on and saying, hey, I've got a technology infusion. I can maybe have a different solution option that's going to get me a different platform, or a, and then hopefully my platform of, hey, here's my solution. You know, I've got these injected bottles that hold liquid. Well, does that match up with what I need in terms of product lines? Um, you know, and you have all sorts of these things, and then that interfaces with the, the vending machines and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, all sorts of these things. We do the same thing with um, trying to aggregate the needs across all those market segments and getting platforms of turbochargers that match up properly. So we don't design a specific turbocharger for every single engine, every single customer. They don't get their own flavor. There's a lot of them, but we match ranges of turbochargers to ranges of engines to products that need to be out there and working. And so you can listen to those inputs, understand what the tensions are, find out what their passion is, and say, hey, I think we can use this, but let's go this direction. And so you're not necessarily refusing and saying, no, you're wrong, go away. It's a, how can I redirect and use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's some of that insight up here at the top that's getting in. So the diagram on the right here reads from top to bottom. Insight comes in at the top. We get products and profits out the bottom, and the, the churn happens in the middle. And say, hey, do these things match up? Do I have an opportunity that matches the need? And then we both be happy. Risk. Um, What do I have up here? Oh, risk. So risk happens. Um, stuff happens is another way to say it. Shit happens, right? So hopefully you guys took a shower sometime in the last 24 hours. Was it risky? No? No dangers at all? Maybe? I think people seem to get so I, I had taken a, sh many years ago when I was probably yay high, I took a shower once and I used too much soap. Bottom of the tub got slippery, I slipped and fell, and now I have a nice little cut here, a scar, where I don't get hair growing on my chin because I scarred myself. So it was a bit of a risk in the tub. So soap by itself is risky, but it also has a good benefit, right? I can actually clean myself, get the stinking dirt off. Um, brushing your teeth, probably don't think, oh, that's not a risky thing, but, you know, is it, is it a safe endeavor? 
right? Um, if, uh, hopefully your buddy didn't exchange your toothpaste tube with some other goop, but um, you know, there's risk in everything. So um, um, I hear from my son that uh, some of the intersections here are quite e exciting. If if you if you um, the the bike lanes and the sidewalks. Um, don't always get respected on, hey, this is a bike lane, only bikes should be here, but people are walking on it. And so he has to dodge and swerve, and you see this guy on the, riding on the sidewalk here. And I know last year, Purdue uh, campus police put out a statement and said, hey, we want you to be a little safer. Follow these things. And there's a whole, I open up the web page, there's like 12 requirements that says, here's how you can be safer on campus. Do they give that to you guys as freshmen and say, hey, here's how to walk safely on campus? You know, use the zebra sidewalks, don't walk in the bike lane. Um, you know, all that sort of stuff. So there's risk. Um, so really the, the, the understanding is, is it's, uh, no system is perfect, right? Plan for it. Something will change. How do I, how do I plan for that? So again, self-driving cars, engines with things that explode in them to make them go, it's risky, but we've designed it so that it's not as risky. The hazard is low enough that it's approachable. Um, you can get in your car, push the button, have it start up, or turn the key, whatever it is, it works. Um, you can drive at high speeds and, and, and in the, in the, you know, with lots of people around you driving also at high speeds and not feel anxious because you feel, oh, I'm gonna I have a really good chance I'm going to die today, right? Is that a really, you know, going to work in a manufacturing facility, great, I'm going into this job. I know I might get hurt today because I've seen five people with their hands, you know, fingers missing. No, you don't see that anymore because it's not, the risk has been reduced to a level um, where it's not quite so bad. Now, to be fair, my son has had to go to the bike shop to get his rim straightened a couple of times because of collisions, but um, it happens. But uh, nobody was hurt. He was wearing a helmet and all sorts of fun stuff. So um, part, of the, part of the risk principle is just going after and figure out, hey, how do I... Um, make sure that I realize every endeavor has some amount of risk. And as we design systems, we try to keep track of those and figure out how can we make it less risky? How can we get after uh, a planning for those so that, you know, in terms of the operation of my product, it's not just doing the design and standard operating of, you know, hey, it's actually, hey, the, the, the thing is waiting in storage. It's it's going to be initialized, it's loading, it's achieving its work, it's, it's being terminated or, or recycled. There's you know, all of these different operational cases of the operations of the product, um, or implementing it or designing it or conceiving it or evolving. They all have different perspectives and how I might assess risk on how can that function of containing that exhaust fail over time or, or how they might that be impacted. And you can apply this lots of different places. So actually, hey, yeah, that was my last slide of principles. So come up with your own stories. Um, really the, the top right icon here is really going after kind of how do I communicate to my stakeholders in Thin Cummins on how to manage the complexity of systems. Um, I, I, I average up quite high, frankly. Um, because I want to try to get the main point across and say, hey, what are your requirements? What are your risks of those requirements not being met? What are the tests that you're doing to make sure that those requirements are going to be satisfied when you create that item or that design? And, and somebody's going to always ask you, how's it going? What's your status? Your parents might be asking you, hey, how's your grades this quarter? Are you ready for a semester? You know, you know, what's going on? How's that working? So I really want to encourage that What's your, the simplicity of your system? It should seem simple, but then you always have the opportunity to dive in deeper and, and really look at the complexity under the hood, so to speak. Um, so these principles are patterns. Again, it's like a fractal. It repeats itself. You should be able to apply it most about anywhere. Um, so thank you. Um, questions, comments, challenges? Hopefully this was on your absorbable. Sometimes it feels like a fire hose, I know. I used to teach class for like 40 hours a week, and so. Okay, the, the experienced guy is gonna ask me a question here. Yeah, Bill. So, uh, machine learning. Yes. AI, how does that change any of these or all of these? 
principle was? Yeah. And I don't think we're thinking in terms of really understanding the perspective of the integrated level. Yes. Yes. It, it will definitely impact the system. There's no doubt about that. Um, from these particular principles, um, the, the, the risk is going to be an interesting, and always has been an interesting conversation about how does machine learning and AI deal with risk? Because if it's being used to address a capability of a system, like a uh, function of, hey, it should really, this AI machine learning should self-correct the fueling on my engine so that it, you know, operates in the most optimum space, most fuel efficient space, whatever. And so do I use that machine learning AI algorithm to actually tune my engine on the fly as you're driving down the road? Well, if I can contain it well enough and I can have an, so it's just a, it's another technology, frankly. And do I understand it well enough, and do I have it bound and constrained well enough that it's not going to be a, a, a control system that goes wacky, right? So, um, actually, already, I mean, machine learning has been in vehicles for years already, right? Cruise control, um, transmission shifts, transmission shift schedules. I remember back in the early 2000s, the mid 2000s, where every time we reflashed an engine, when I was doing that Dodge Ram truck, every time we reflashed the engine it had a learning cycle that the transmission had to go through for a while to figure out its drivetrain configuration on the fly because when we reset everything it went back to a default and so we actually had to learn a transmission and it was it was a machine learning I mean it's fairly simple but I mean but it was bound as well so it does impact it I mean that's intriguing yeah Yeah. Still cast it. Yeah. Sometimes that holding in there and just separating the motors to the driver of the car and interacting. There's a lot of systems in there and it's often down. Mm hmm. It, 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 it's an interesting, I, 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 I really like it because the whole system of systems, which are a bunch of independent operational elements that are independently designed, developed, and whatnot. So I've got a bunch of these things. Um, so it's like driving down the road, it's a system of systems, right? Every driver is their own system and their own controller and all of that sort of stuff. But how do they interact? How do they as a group do something together? Get a bunch of people and product from point A to point B from Louisville to Indianapolis and to Chicago and beyond. Um, but then if, as systems engineers we try to think about how can I optimize that? I can't control everyone top down. It's a middle out sort of thing and it's an intriguing problem set because and it really gets into some of the stuff we do also is product planning and how do I have turbochargers and after treatment and battery systems and electronic controls and engines and power gen units and customers all kind of doing product development at the same time. They're all funded differently. My tools that I help strategize and get in the system as well are all funded differently. That's by IT versus the business. And so how do I coordinate all of this? I can't. And so it's kind of picking and choosing my battles. It's, it's more heuristic right now, to me at least. I, from a theoretical system sciences perspective, the base fundamentals, I don't have old dead guys writing books that wrote books, the, the physics stuff that really I can count on. So, good question. Sounds like a research topic. <laughs> Anything else? Can you guys write your own stories for this? Some of these? Take a look at the paper. Um, gets into a little bit more examples. Um, there's one page for each of these principles. Gets into it. Um, I'd encourage you to read through it at least once and then wait a year and read it again. Wait a year, read it again. So could you give us a little bit more context with regard to the paper in the level of principles? You said it was five years ago you took the class. Yeah. So this was a, I actually did this, this, this was my, this was the, uh,